is a lovely old melody, and uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Lonesome Old Town, and you'll hear the trombone soloing of Phil Wilson. Good evening and welcome. My name is Kiro Gerstein and you've tuned into Kiro Gerstein Invites, an online forum seminar series hosted by Kronberg Academy. And this is our last session, the season finale before the summer break. And I'm absolutely delighted that the renowned linguist, scholar, writer, and jazz trombonist Samuel J. Kaiser has agreed to join us. As a little side note, there is a um, reason, aside from its um, great aesthetic beauty, 
uh, to have played this video for you and this great solo of uh, Phil Wilson, because in our communication with, uh, with Jay in the run up to the seminar, uh, we figured out that he studied with Phil um, some decades ago, I uh, can't name the exact number of years, and I studied with uh, Phil at Berkeley uh, back in mid-90s when, when I was a student there. So, um, but Jay will talk about music, talk about jazz, I'm sure, but here's, he's here to talk from his many interests and, um, and book themes. He's going to talk to us about the mental life of modernism. And um, I think I'm not the one to tell you uh, his thesis, obviously he is, but I'm delighted to welcome him. As always, your participation is very crucial. So at the end, there's a chance to pose questions and make comments. I'm monitoring them in the chat and I'll I'll pass them on to Jay. And here he is. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to share the screen. You can tell me if we've, uh, if we've got it right. Yes, we have it right. Okay, good. Well, I should tell you, Tyrell, uh, that that's uh, a tough act to follow. That is uh, one of the most spectacular trombone solos I think uh, ever recorded. And uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to have studied with Phil, but also to know him. But I also want to thank you, uh, Kirill Gerstein, for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, uh, The uh, Mental Life of Modernism, which is a book that um, I uh, uh, published in uh, last year, I think it came out in March. Uh, the thing is that uh, this is a book uh, written after um, a um, really a, a, a professional lifetime of thinking about the remarkable shift that occurred at the turn of the 20th century, the one that ushered in the period called modernism. Now, modernism is um, the name given to the sea change that came over the sister arts of poetry, music, and painting at the turn of the 20th century when three things happened. Poetry ceased to be metrical and to rhyme. Music ceased to be tonal. And painting ceased to be representational. Uh, that is to say, mimetic. This is a remarkable uh, confluence of artistic events and uh, surely they are related. But the question was how, and as I said, I spent a professional lifetime trying to figure out uh, how this uh, uh, happened. And uh, that's what really, uh, what the book is about. So what exactly happened? Well, here is, um, uh, I wanna begin with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis that I want to make is this. Art is the product of shared rules. Now, what do I mean uh, by uh, this when I say that uh, 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 art is uh, the result of uh, rules uh, shared? What I mean is that an artist uses rules to construct a work of art and an audience uses those same rules to parse it, that is to say, to understand it. Uh, it's no different from what I'm doing now. I, I have a set of rules in my head. I'm using those rules to construct sentences which convey a meaning. You have the same set of rules in your head and you're using those rules to extract the meaning. If you didn't have those rules, you wouldn't be able to uh, uh, understand what I'm saying. If I spoke in a language that you didn't know, that would, that would, what not knowing that language means is you don't, you and I don't share those rules. Now, curiously, this notion of shared rules between uh, two uh, members of a species uh, is rather like a suggestion made by two neurobiologists, uh, Bentley and Hoy in 1974, in an article in the Scientific American called the neurobiology of cricket song. With respect to the genetic mechanism governing chirping calls between male and female crickets, they wrote, 
Moreover, their work suggests that similar genetic systems could be involved in encoding information for constructing either a neuronal network that will respond to a specific song pattern or a network that will produce a specific song pattern. Indeed, there is a fascinating possibility that some of the same genes are involved in both systems. This is very interesting, the next sentence. Such an assemblage of genes would be a fail-safe means of ensuring the synchronous evolution of the transmitter and the receiver. Now that raises the possibility, since I think that's exactly what's happening in human beings, that this business of sharing the same set of uh, rules from crickets to human beings may in fact be a basic evolutionary uh, uh, function, but that's not what my uh, uh, talk is about today. But I thought that I would mention that because uh, it's, it's, it's extremely uh, suggestive comment. So what are shared rules? Well, let me just give you an example. Consider the sentence, instinctively, eagles that fly swim. Our common ornithological knowledge tells us that what eagles instinctively do is, is fly, not swim. And yet when I give you this sentence, you know that the sentence means instinctively eagles swim. So even though the sentence makes, uh, it, it contradicts reality, uh, uh, the facts of reality, uh, the rules of the sentence, that is to say, the whatever, whatever rules of construction are involved in this sentence, uh, tell us instinctively goes with uh, swim. Now, you might think, well, maybe the way to do it is to look at the distance between an adverb and the relevant verb. But th that won't work because you can see here that fly is in fact closer to instinctively than swim. It's actually uh, the fourth word over, but swim is the fifth word over, and yet instinctively goes with the farthest word. Okay, so how is it then that we match up instinctively with swim? Well, this is what linguists uh, have said. When you hear a sentence and a string of words, you're not hearing just a string of words. You're hearing a structure that is... Uh, 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 it, within which those words are embedded. And this is extremely important because what this says, notice this structure isn't in the words. It's not in the real world. It's in your head. So this structure, when you hear instinctively eagles that fly swim, you provide this kind of a uh, analysis of that sentence. Namely, it has an adverb, a noun phrase, and a verb. The noun phrase consists of a noun and a sentence. Now, this gives us a way to automatically, well, not automatically, but this gives us a way to uh, now define why instinctively uh, is understood by speakers as going with swim. And the answer is, it is indeed a question of the closest, uh, but closest is, uh, depends on how you count. And you count according to a, a series of labels that, as I said, is only in your head. So it goes like this. Instinctively goes with its closest verb, where closest is defined as the number of nodes you have to travel along a tree to get there. So starting with instinctively, node one, node two, node three, node four, node five. Five nodes to get to fly, but node one, node two, node three, three nodes to get to swim. And so the rule is a very simple one, namely instinctively goes with the nearest verb where nearest is, this, is defined in terms of the number of nodes that you have to travel to get from instinctively to the verb. And remember that structure, those, no, those verbs are, those nodes are not in the real world, they're in your head. Now this kind of dependency is called structural dependency. And it's probably the deepest, one of the deepest properties of human language. Every language that we know of is, um, uh, that we know of, I'm gonna blacken the screen now. Uh, uh, every language that we know of uh, is, uh, uh, its rules are structurally dependent. 
I'll open up the screen in a minute. But I wanted to uh, uh, d uh, discuss something with you because I think it will provide you with a good example or a good sense of what it is I'm about to say about modernism. The notion of structural dependency gave two researchers, Neil Smith and Ianthi Chimpley, an idea. What they did was they uh, th thought that they could use this structural dependent property of language in order to illuminate uh, how the brain works. Now, uh, the reason why I want to explore this, as I said, is because I think it sheds light on uh, what gave rise to modernism. And in short, I want to lay the groundwork for this argument. The shift called modernism was a lot like replacing one's natural language with an artificial one. I want to argue that this shift actually involved a shift in what areas of the brain were involved in experiencing works of art before and after the advent of modernism. So that's quite literally what I want to do. And now I want to show you uh, how uh, uh, the work of structural dependency uh, illuminates that. So Smith and Simply published a book called The Mind of a Savant. And it was the story of a boy named Christopher who had a remarkable ability to acquire language, but whose general intelligence was severely impaired. It was so impaired that he couldn't count. He couldn't put, he couldn't say one, two, three. He just couldn't do it. But this, his ability to learn a language never shut off. He spoke with some degree of competence, Danish, Dutch, Finnish, French, German, Hindi, Italian, modern Greek, Norwegian, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Swedish, Turkish, and Welsh. He spoke all of those things, but he couldn't count. Okay, now, this is uh, uh, the experiment. What they did was, they made an, a natural, they made an artificial language called EPUN, A-P-U-N, and they taught it to Christopher, and it used structurally dependent rules, like rules of, of, in other words, possible language rules, rules that they constructed based on the model of what they knew about English and other languages in the world. These are possible rules. But then what they, and they also had a control group, a group of undergraduates, and they taught the undergraduates who were not impaired at all, uh, the same uh, uh, artificial language. Then they threw in a monkey wrench they threw in a rule that was, from the point of view of natural language, an impossible rule. That is to say, it was a rule that doesn't occur in any language in the world. And this is really quite remarkable because the rule is a kind of very simple one. You would expect some language to show it. So it's really quite remarkable that it doesn't. But the rule had this property. It counted. And so what they did was, in order to introduce an emphasis into a sentence, they taught the rule, insert the morpheme nog, the, the syllable nog, after the third word of every sentence. So in this artificial language, fa, za, dilian, hibalu, log, gov, just, you know, there was an, as I said, it's an artificial language. The, the hash marks indicate words, one, two, three, insert nog. One, two, three, insert not. One, two, th three, insert not. Easy to do, but Christopher could never learn it. He could never learn it because he couldn't count. And interestingly enough, the grand undergraduates who were in the language learning mode, they didn't get the rule either because they were using that part of their brain that produces grammars and that part of the brain never offers them the hypothesis counting matters. Now, some 21 years later, Andrea Moro, in a book called The Boundaries of Babel, describes a, a similar experiment that he did. He worked with Italian, German, and Japanese speakers and taught each of them versions of a language they didn't know. He reports on one experiment in which eight German-speaking subjects, four men and four women, 
all right-handed, all having been exposed only to their native language, were taught a version of Italian with both possible and impossible rules. With the benefit of fMRI mapping, he was able to observe brain activity while participants worked on their tasks. When they were asked to judge the grammaticality of sentences constructed with possible rules, i.e. rules that, for example, use structural dependency, Broca's area, which is an area associated with syntactic productivity in the brain, showed heightened activity. But when they were asked to judge the grammality of sentences constructed with impossible rules, activity in Broca's area diminished and brain activity became quite diffuse, suggesting that now the language learners were not treating this as learning a language, but they were treating it as solving a puzzle. This is essentially what Andrea said about it. The brain has sorted out the syntactic data without the subjects realizing it. Broca's area, which is included in the network that is naturally predisposed for syntactic tasks, has been progressively activated when, progressing, when processing rules that respected structure dependency, while it has been progressively deactivated when processing sentences that did not. All right. Now then, let's ask again, what happened? Well, all previous explanations of what happened when poetry, painting, and music changed at the turn of the 20th century were cultural in nature. Eric Kandel, in his Age of Insight, said modernism began in the mid-19th century as a response not only to the restrictions and hypocrisies of everyday life, but also as a reaction to the Enlightenment's emphasis on the rationality of human behavior. In, 19, in 1838, the painter Paul de la Roche, on seeing his first, first daguerreotype, is reported to have said, painting is dead. Richard Taruskin, in his monumental Oxford history of Western music, attributed what had happened to music to apocalyptic presentiments by which he must have meant something like uh, the anxiety that uh, many thought, uh, many shared when uh, we changed, the, the calendar changed from 1999 to uh, uh, 2000. Uh, Ezra Pound, uh, in uh, uh, his uh, cantos, the first of which I think was published around 1916, declared to break the pentameter that was the first heave. And in a letter to a, a young poet uh, uh, who had written him about her poetry, he wrote, against the metric pattern, struggle toward natural language. You haven't yet got sense of quantity. The best mechanism for breaking up the stiffness and literary idiom is a different meter. The goddamn iambic magnetizes certain verbal sequences. Okay, these cultural explanations are sui generis. That is to say, each one is unique to its own art form and it doesn't generalize. Candell's suggestion that modernism resulted from a reaction to the Enlightenment's emphasis on rationality doesn't explain why poetry ceased to be metrical or to rhyme or why music ceased to be tonal. Eschewing rhyme and meter in poetry because they are somehow whether stultifying with respect to uh, portraying the full panoply of human emotions, says nothing about what happened in painting and music, and apocalyptic presentiments, whatever they might be, knocking tonal music out of the box, says nothing about poetry or painting. Now, it may be that these three uh, events are indeed unrelated, and that this is the best that you can do. But I think that there are two reasons to believe otherwise. The first is that the same thing happened to all three art forms. Constraints closely associated with each one were abandoned. Before the abandonment, poetry, music, and painting were easily accessible. In fact, you didn't have to have college courses in a particular poet. That's because it was perfectly clear what the poet was saying. And so you could, the, 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 the artist made the poem and the with a set of rules, and the reader read the poem using the same set of rules, and that was it. But after the abandonment, poetry, music, and painting were inaccessible. That is, they became an acquired taste that had to be learned. 
Now, that's why I think that these three things are, require a single explanation. And so here is an alternative account of modernism. And if you want to understand what I'm doing, it's this. I'm putting a different explanation on the table for people to think about. And here's that explanation. It's the nature of the constraints that are relevant, not the culture. The sister arts of poetry, painting, and music depend upon shared sets of rules, just as language depends upon a shared set of rules. Now, I'm going to give you a promissory note. In a moment, I'm going to show you exactly what those rules are and why I think they're shared. So this is not something, this is not going to be just an assertion. I'm going to try to prove it to you. Artists exercise such rules when they create a work of art, say a poem. Audience exercise the same shared set when they encounter that work of art. It's the exercise of these rules occasioned by the work of art that is the source of artistic pleasure. In other words, that's the cricket hypothesis. And then finally, at the turn of the 20th century, artists abandon shared rules based on the natural predilections of the brain because of a perception that the output of the rules had been exhausted that they had done all they could. Now, why rules? This is important. You can't have art without rules. This was stated, I thought, very eloquently in a set of lectures by Igor Stravinsky that he gave at Harvard in 1939 and 40. Uh, this was when uh, Stravinsky uh, left Europe and was en route to uh, Los Angeles. And this is what he wrote. And yet, which of us has ever heard talk of art as other than a realm of freedom? This sort of heresy, that is to say, the heresy is art as a realm of freedom. This sort of heresy is uniformly widespread because it is imagined that art is outside the bounds of ordinary activity. And that's exactly, I, I think he got it. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Art is not outside the bounds of ordinary activity. It is within the bounds. That is to say, pre-modern art. Well, in art, as in everything else, one can build only upon a resisting foundation. Whatever constantly gives way to pressure constantly renders movement impossible. So here's the picture thus far. Art needs rules. Abandoning shared rules means creating unshared because you've got to have rules. But unshared rules are, by definition, private. Private rules are, by definition, not naturally accessible because they're not shared. Art appreciation became an Easter egg hunt. And now I want to say something about what I mean by an Easter egg hunt. When shared rules were abandoned and private formats took their place, these formats were unique to the artist. They had to be discovered. Unlike the shared pre-modernist structures, they were like software Easter eggs. Now, what I mean by software Easter eggs, many of you probably already know this, forgive me, but perhaps I'd like to, to explain it for those who might not know about it. Uh, in uh, the 1970s, a uh, video game maker by the name of, uh, called Atari uh, published a game called Adventure. And a in 1979, a 15-year-old player of this game came upon a mysterious thing. He accidentally clicked on a uh, pixel, and all of a sudden, a message appeared on the screen created by Warren Robinette. And he was surprised because this had nothing to do with the game. He accidentally tripped over a principle. Up comes this message. So he wrote to Atari. And his letter ended up on the desk of a man by the name of Steve Wright, whose job it was apparently to deal with such things. And what Steve Wright, Steve Wright had realized was this, Atari had refused to allow Robinette to assign his name as the creator of adventure because they were afraid that some other company would hire him away. Robinette didn't like that. So he decided to get around that by putting his name in the game but secretly, and that was the Easter egg. And Steve Wright had the choice 
well, we're either going to recall all the games and reprogram, reprogram, or we're going to leave. We're going to, um, if you can't lick them, join them. He decided to join them, and I think he was the one who, who coined the term Easter egg. The FedEx proposed, uh, a logo that you see on your screen now has an Easter egg in it, and I want to give you a moment to find it. The Easter egg in the FedEx poster, if you see it, great. If you don't see it, you will be pleasantly surprised and never forget it, is this. There's an arrow. And the arrow is formed by the juxtaposition of the E and the X. Now, this particular poster was designed by Lyndon Leader. And I discovered this quote from him in a, uh, on a line in an e-zine called The Sneeze, in November 16, 2004, and this is what he wrote, and I'm quoting it because it's as good a definition of an Easter egg as I think you'll find. The power of the hidden arrow is simply that it is a hidden bonus. It is a positive reverse optical kind of thing. Either you see it or you don't. Importantly, not getting the punchline by not seeing the arrow does not induce the impact of the logo's essential communication. On the other hand, if you do see the arrow or someone points it out to you, you won't forget it. That is an Easter egg. Here's another one. This is perhaps the most iconic uh, film poster uh, of the 20th century. Uh, I believe it was actually uh, designed by a man named Sam Green, who is a, uh, a London illustrator. But if you go online and look at the various examples of this poster, You'll never, you won't find the name. I had to send out feelers and someone uh, told me who the man's name. I never uh, uh, double checked it, but it doesn't matter. There is a poster. It's uh, very iconic. It's very striking. And there's an Easter egg in it. Can you find the Easter egg in the poet, poster? Look at the thorax of the African death's head moth, hawk moth. It appears to be a skull. And in fact, the real moth does have a vaguely skull-like pattern there. But in fact, it's not. The markings of an African death's head hawk moth at all. It's a compression onto the thorax of this. And this is a photograph put together by Salvador Dali and Philip Holtzmann called in Voluptate Mors in 1951. And it was about the temptation of St. Anthony and his struggle with transcending the desire for flesh during his awakening in the desert. It combines death and voluptuousness. Now, in order for me to be able to use this picture, this is just a sidebar, which you might find interesting. In order for me to be able to use this picture in my book, I had to uh, contact the Halsman uh, estate and its curator is now Philip Halsman's um, grandson. And he wrote me, quote, you should know that the usage was unauthorized. Given the nature of the film being about a psychopathic woman hating serial murder, we do not appreciate being associated with such content. Well, so, so you have it. Now, Easter eggs turn out to be very, very common in art. Uh, if you go back, I think you can go back as far as the, the Song of Songs in the Bible and find examples, but I want to start with music and poetry at the same time, and I want to start in the 14th century. I'm going to play something for you in a moment. Uh, it is the music that this particular poem was, um, uh, was set to. The poem was by Guillaume de Marchot, Ma fin et mon commencement, mon commencement, ma fin. And the speaker is, in fact, the poem itself. And what the, uh, the internal couplets are telling you is how the music uh, is to be performed. And then it ends, my end is my beginning, my beginning, my end. And you'll notice there's this crisscross structure. Ask not what you can do for your country, but what your country can do for you. It's called chiasmus. My end is my beginning. Now what I'm going to do is play for you the Women's Early Music Vocal Ensemble concert 
the seventh concert on June 26, 2013, at the Jap Japan Evangelical Lutheran Tokyo Church. And there are, I, I, I imagine that there are musicians in the audience. I don't know if you can get this Easter egg. Let me tell you that I play the trombone. I can't. I, there's no way in, there's no possible way I could get, I, I think I could understand this. And I wonder if others actually can get it. My view is that you can't. It's, in, it's inaccessible unless you have a brain of a Mozart. But here it is. I'm going to, uh, I'll give you a hint. You can tell when the, uh, uh, the hint is when the scene, when the picture changes the, uh, uh, from uh, this particular view to a different one. So here we go. That's enough to, to tell you what's going on. And now let me show you what's happening in this piece of music. It is, of course, a retrograde. It's probably the best retrograde ever composed. It's absolutely gorgeous. And notice the complexity of the retrograde. It consists of three parts, a triplum, a contus, and a tenor. And it's 20 measures. The first half is 20, and the second half is 20. This is measure 20. This is measure 21. And you'll notice that the tenor part is becomes in the last 20 measures of the song is nothing but the tenor part backwards. So here's a D, here's a D, and there is a C, and there's a C, et cetera, et cetera. Every note back, back. However, it's not just that. That's why I think it's really impossible to get this Easter egg. You get the same retrograde motion in the triplex, in the triplum, and in the cantus, but it switches at bar 20. So for example, the triplum uh, is now the cantus backwards and the cantus at bar 21 is now the triplum backwards. So it looks like this. Here's the poem, there's the crisscross of the verse and there's the crisscross of the music. The triplum at bar 20 is now the cantus in reverse. The cantus at bar 20 is now the triplum in reverse. The tenor at bar 20 is now the tenor in reverse. You can't keep this in your head. And the poet and the composer Machaud did it. Why? Well, because I think it was fun, because he could. But it's obvious what he's doing. He's having the structure of the music mirror the structure of the poem. This kind of thing didn't just happen in music. Here is Geoffrey Chaucer's translation of Autant de Grandson. Now, Grandson was uh, considered to be the epitome of a chivalric knight in France in uh, the 14th century. He was a Savoyard knight. He had a distinguished military career. He was also a poet. He wrote about 80 poems, a couple of almost a couple of hundred verses, and he um, uh, fell out of favor with the king and was forced to uh, leave France, he went to England where he met Chaucer and he and Chaucer were friends. And Chaucer uh, did him the honor of translating one of his ballads from the Complaint of Venus uh, into Middle English. This is uh, the French and here's Chaucer's rendition. Now I wanna tell you that Chaucer's rendition does not, I mean, it's, uh, a, a, it's a good translation of Autant uh, ballad but it's not a word for word translation because he's changed it in order to introduce an Easter egg. Nobody will get the Easter egg, but it's there. 
Now sift this lovely district of Kumanab, that men for dare would be the noble thing as rock a bed and fasten at the top, wiping the cloth and sing and complaining, and doing the cast of visage and looking, often the sounds are here, the continence, the plain and sleeping and dreaming at the dance, all the reverse of any glad feeling. What is he saying? He is saying, now certain love, it makes, it's perfectly reasonable that men pay dearly for you so that they are awake when they should be sleeping and they are fast when they're at the dinner table. They weep when they should be crying and they sing when they should be uh, complaining. They look down, they cast their, their visage and uh, their glance downward. They change their complexion and their countenance. They uh, complain when they're sleeping, they dream at the dance and and, uh, all, and then at the, the last line here is the critical one, all the reverse of any glad feeling. Chaucer has built into this translation reversal. How has he done it? The first line consists of a gerund followed by an infinitive. In other words, the building blocks of his reversal are uh, Middle English morphology. Gerund, infinitive, infinitive gerund, A, B, mirrored by B, A. Down to cast visions and down to cast now those two, adverb, verb, infin, now, noun, adverb, infinitive, now, now, those are parallels of one another. And then line seven is a reversal, just like line A, it's, but it's, in, it's a reversal of the fourth line. Gerund, infinitive, infinitive gerund, and then the reversal of that. So that the pattern looks like that. The bottom is mirrored by the top. The first line is mirrored by the last line. And he's obviously created, he's built into the morphology of the, of the translation, its meaning, just as uh, Monchot did the same thing with his. But it's highly unlikely that uh, anybody's ever going to see that. I've read a lot of critics and they've never uh, of, of these particular things and nobody saw it. Now, I want to try to, uh, that, so those are what Easter eggs are, and what have I said? I've said that Easter eggs are things which are hidden in the work of art. Uh, they don't affect the work of art, but uh, they're there, and the artist put it in there for unknown reasons, but it's, you can easily imagine what they might be. And I've said that they are go back to the 13th century, giving you examples of that. And what I'm going to try to argue is that these Easter eggs, which are sort of like uh, things that artists did by the by, were essentially became the heart of modernist poetry and, and painting and music. And that's why it was so inaccessible because uh, art, which used to be uh, a phenomena of shared rules, turned into an Easter egg hunt. But now I want to show you why I say the rules are shared. Let me show you this poem by John Keats. It's a sonnet. It's a Petrarchan sonnet. It consists of eight lines with a rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, and then a, a sestet. Here the, the rhyme scheme is A, B, C, B. Uh, let's see, what is it? It's, uh, there's, yeah, it's uh, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. The rhyme scheme is on the right. Uh, C, D, D, C, D, C. Okay. So now here... This uh, poem is written in iambic pentameter. I'm not going to read the whole thing because um, I don't want to uh, take up uh, that much time. But what it means is that every line is supposed to be written in the same meter. It's just like saying, you know, uh, let's say uh, 16 bars of satin doll is, uh, is uh, written in the same key. How many bards gild the lapses of time? A few of them have ever been the food of my delighted fancy. I could brood over their beauties, earthly or sublime. And often when I sit me down to rhyme, these will in throngs before my mind intrude. Now, what I've done here is shown you what is iambic pentameter? What were you taught about iambic pentameter in high school? Well, you were taught that it was a series of 10 syllables and uh, 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 that are interspersed with unstressed, uh, lesser stressed, and more stressed syllables, and that they alternate weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, so that the stronger stressed syllables occur 
in the even positions, the weaker ones in the odd positions. And I've given you an example of that. The slant line indicates the stress, the hyphen indicates the lesser stress, the curve tolls the knell of parting day. And what's interesting is, if that is the rhyme scheme, what I've done on the left is I've indicated all of the stresses in Keats's poem. Now look, in, a, in the iconic, in the canonical iambic pentameter line, there are five stresses dispersed along the, the, we, the, the even positions of a line. But if you look at the, the actual occurrence here, it's nowhere like that. Here, this has got six stresses, this has got three, 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 four stresses, three, six stresses, three, five, four, five, five, three, seven. They, they vary wildly. Not only that, the only line in the poem that approaches the iconic, the curfew tolls and all of party day is line 12, which is um, with solemn sound and thousand others more. So 7% of the poem matches the, the, uh, the canonical form of it. So we need a better description of what makes a poem uh, metrical, iambic, iambically. And I'm gonna now give that to you. Remember, I'm giving you shared rules. I'm, going to, I'm claiming that the rules that I'm showing you, Keats used in his head when he wrote these lines, and he knew that you had the same rules in your head when you scanned it. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna make an argument about why that must be true. We assume an iambic pentameter metrical pattern. There's the metrical positions. There's 10 of them. There's uh, two types, a weak and a strong, and they alternate. Now we partner every syllable of the line with one of the metrical elements. That's what these vertical lines mean is, attach this syllable to this position, this syllable to this position. And you do that until you've exhausted all the syllables in the line. Then what you do is you now assign this uh, array the stresses uh, of the line. And uh, that's what I've done here. But I'm assuming but is a stress, but no confusion, no disturbance group. Okay, so far I hope so good. Now I want to bring in the theoret uh, theoretically the, uh, the operative uh, uh, principle. What I'd like to claim is that there is within any distribution of stresses and hyphens, of slants and hyphens, you will find, you, you will find, you, well, you may find, because not every line has to have it, but you look for a sequence hyphen, stress, hyphen. And we'll call that a stress maximum. Now here is the constraint. If you find a sequence, hyphen, stress, hyphen, at least one of the hyphens must be in the same word as the stress. And indeed, I've indicated the stress maxima in this line in red. And you'll see that the hyphen here comes over few and the hyphen here comes over turd. So the line, but no confusion, no disturbance rude can be scanned as having two stress maxima and the stress maxima uh, 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 are assigned, uh, are um, partnered with an S position. So here's the rule. If a line has a stress maxima, unstressed, stress, stress uh, uh, unstressed, with the understanding that one of the hyphens has to be in the same word as the stress, then the stress must be partnered with an S. So you see there, we've, this is the line we just looked at, and that indicates that it's partnered with an S and therefore we, I've colored the whole thing red. And what I'm basically saying there is that the syllable few and the syllable turd are not only stressed, but they are stress maxima. And now let's take a look at this line. No theory is any good unless it can also tell you what lines can't occur. And the, the theory that I just explained tells you that this line would never occur in an iambic pentameter poem. And I think that's right. You'll see here that it has three stress uh, maxima, but unfortunately they all occur on a W position. So that this line is unmetrical. Sonnet 30 by the master Shakespeare 
will not occur uh, uh, in a poem that has lines like, uh, uh, but no confusion, no disturbance root. All right. Now let's take a look at the first line of Keats's poem, How Many Bards Guild the Lapses of Time. And let's scan it. There is the identification of the syllables with the metrical, the elements of the metrical pattern. Now there's the distribution of the stresses. Now let's find a stress maximum. There it is. It's over lap. Lap is the stress maximum because it is a polysyllabic word. It has a stress in the first syllable and it has an unstressed to its right in the same word and an unstressed to its left. Therefore, how many bards guild the lapses of time is an unmetrical line. And my, the theory that I've described to you says that it's unmetrical. Now we've got a problem. Either the poet made a mistake, which is highly unlikely when you're a poet like John Keats. Either the theory is wrong, which is far more likely if you're a theorist like me, or what's, there is a third possibility, namely that both the theory and the poet are right. That is to say, he wanted the line to be perceived as unmetrical. And when you read the line and see what it's about, that's exactly the, uh, it, precise thing that you want to understand about this line. The line is an example of what it's about. It is an example of a lapse of time where time is understood in, in the term of metrical. How many bards guilt the lapses of time? It is itself an example of what it's decrying. There's no way you could possibly have gotten that metrical joke if you didn't have the same rules that Keats had. It's no different than if I tell you a joke. If I say, look, a duck walks into a pharmacy and he says to the pharmacist, I'd like some chapstick, please. And the pharmacist says, oh, yeah, how do you want to pay for it? And the duck says, just put it on my bill. Now, I couldn't possibly expect you to get that joke unless I knew that you had in your head precisely the same lexical entry that I had in my head, the one that helped me to construct the joke. Well, I didn't make up that joke, but the constructor, namely that there's a, there's a syllable bill and it has two meanings, namely the reckoning of uh, uh, in, uh, in money for services rendered or the proboscis of an avian. And it depends on those two meanings to be funny. That's exactly the same thing with uh, uh, the shared rules of meter. What about the shared rules of music? Now here I buy lock, stock and barrel. The, the uh, theory of, of music that was uh, uh, put forward in a book in 1983, a seminal book by Fred Lerdahl and Ray Jackendorf, uh, in which they described what they said, the, uh, the rules which enable people uh, to mentally construct music when they hear it in the same way that you're mentally constructing my sentences when you hear them. Uh, here's what they said, and I'll quote. One speaks of music as segmented into units of all sizes of patterns of strong and weak beats, of thematic relationships, of pitches as ornamental or structurally important, of tension and repose and so forth. Insofar as one wishes to ascribe some sort of reality to these kinds of structure, one must ultimately treat them as mental products imposed on or inferred from the physical signal, just as that tree is a mental product and instinctively eagles that fly swim. In our view, the central task of music theory should be to explicate this mentally produced organization. Seen in this way, music theory takes a place among traditional areas of cognitive psychology, such as theories of vision and language. So they have essentially three uh, components, grouping, tonal structure, and metrical structure. And they also have rules, uh, prolongation rules, uh, which uh, they call prolongation rules, which uh, uh, talk about the relationship between two notes, which one is stronger than the other one, which one is a grace note, which one is sort of leading up to or leading down to uh, a more important note. And I'm not going to deal with those rules because I don't want to really get into the complexities of this theory. I just want to show you what the rules 
essentially give you a feel for what they look like and to say that there is abundant evidence that these rules are built into our brains. First of all, there's the grouping rules. They claim that uh, when we hear music, one of the things that we do naturally is group the sounds into larger chunks. Uh, the line A here uh, consists of three notes which are identical followed by four notes which are identical and the brackets underneath say that we will group them in that fashion and as they say the application of the strong principles of proximity and similarity are what are operating in the assignment of grouping structure. Uh, the second line has the same notes but the claim there is that the insertion of a rest is a very strong marker of the end of a chunk, the, uh, the end of a group, and the beginning of another group. And so that even though the notes are similar, uh, the rest can uh, affect what group you will do, uh, you will make. And the, uh, the C line says that the distance between two notes is also uh, something that people use uh, that's, uh, when they uh, group things. And there is abundant. Um, uh, there is abundant psychological experimentation uh, that has independently corroborated that pe this ability of people to uh, group. What about the, the, the scale, the scalar system? They, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Lerdahl and Jackendorf say is that in a tonal system, every note of the music is heard in relation to a particular fixed pitch the to tonic or tonal center of the tonic may be sounded continuously throughout a piece, for instance, by a bagpipe drone or the tambour drone in Indian raga, or the tonic may be implicit. They might also have added the didgeridoo. Um, I actually have a didgeridoo that I bought in Australia, and um, uh, I was uh, surprised to learn that many trombone players actually use the didgeridoo uh, when they uh, play. It's a terrific way to practice circular breathing, and it's also a terrific way to relax after you've been practicing. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, this is obvious uh, here. You know, this, this is shows you the octave. This shows you the uh, division of the octave into a first, a fifth, and a octave, and then the division of the, of the, the tonic and the fifth into a third to produce a triad. And again, there's abundant evidence to show that this is built into the brain. Isabel Peretz in an issue of Cognition notes, quote, psychologists were the first to point out that tonal scale systems are almost universal in the music of the world's cultures. Dowling and Harwood have found only a handful of cultures in which the pitches used in singing did not provide evidence of scale steps. But the overwhelming majority of cultures use stable musical scales that share several general properties, discrete pitch levels, octave equivalents, moderate number of pitches within the octave, which which are repeated through different octaves, and a tonal hierarchy in which certain pitches function as stable points of melodic resolution and others as contrasting unstable points. Now, the third uh, grouping is the metrical one, and this is uh, the one in which you indicate the rhythm of a piece. I just might say in passing that I've, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the psychology of music, and I've asked a number of um, my colleagues who are professional musicians uh, and very skilled ones at that, uh, to them, what is the, uh, what are the prominent elements of, uh, in their view of music? And every one of them says that the most important one, ones are melody and rhythm. And that surprises me because uh, progression, the har harmony, which of course came later than melody and rhythm uh, in Western culture, but the harmony is not. Uh, uh, the number one. What's uh, 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 chord progressions are not as important as the rhythm and the and the melody, and I think that's something to think about. But in terms of uh, the rhythm, uh, you can actually uh, look at the rhythm of a uh, tune. Here is "We All Live in a Yellow Submarine" by the Beatles, and you can look at the the rhythm with the same uh, a notion, uh, the same way in which we looked at the poetry. What you do is. This is a, you divide the music up into bars and you declare that uh, this rhythm will be 4-4 um, four, four time. That is to say, there will be four beats in a bar. A quarter note will get a beat. And now you assign an X to each beat, just like you assign a syllable to each metrical element. 
you get that, and so you get one, two, three, four. Then the second line in this hierarchy, uh, you'll notice what they say about uh, this is the basic unit of metrical structure is a beat, a point in time usually associated with the onset of a node. Beats are combined into a metrical grid, a hierarchical pattern of beats of different relative strengths. And that's uh, very similar to poetry, except that poetry is not isochronous, music is. But then you can see that the second line says that it's actually the first and the uh, the third beat are more important than the second and the fourth. And this third line says, and of the four beats, the first one is, is the most important. Um, now, because I've said that this is like poetry, you might be inclined to say, well, yes, we all know that there is a, uh, a similarity between language and music. I would like to say, no, that's not true. There have been evidence, of, there's been a... Uh, uh, some work done at MIT recently by uh, Ava Fedorenko, which shows that that portion of the brain, which is being used to uh, parse music, has nothing to do with that portion of the brain, which is used to parse language. And so those two are completely separate. But that raises an interesting question. If they are separate, and I think that they are, and have to be treated quite differently, why does meter and... Um, uh, in uh, uh, and stress. Why does meter in uh, uh, in poetry and uh, and uh, meter in uh, tempo in music? Why do they uh, look so much alike? Anyway, you can see in this here is uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Ringo Starr. Now they're going to perform Yellow Submarine, and you'll notice that Kimmel is beating on the back beats. He's not hitting one and and. Uh, 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 one and three, but he's hitting two and four, and that's because he's got this internalized into his head. obviously having much too much fun. All right. Now, this for me was the most uh, uh, interesting of all. I sort of knew or had a rough idea about the shared rules of music and the shared rules of, uh, of uh, meter. But I was puzzled for a long time about painting. How would I think about painting? And um, I started by reading a book uh, by E.H. Conbridge called Art and Illusion. And for and those of you who are interested in it, uh, I recommend this book. It's really a terrific book. And in this book, uh, the problem uh, is actually limbed by Gombrich when he quotes a conversation that took place between Apollonius of Tyana, a first century philosopher, and his disciple Damis. And it was recorded by a fourth century philosopher by the name of Philostratus. And this is uh, the uh, conversation. Then Apollonius asks again, painting is imitation, mimesis? Well, what else answers Damis? If it did not do that, it would just be a ridiculous playing about with colors, <laughs> which actually some might think happened after modernism. Uh, yes, says his mentor, but what about the things we see in the sky? when the clouds are drifting, the centaurs and stag antelopes and wolves and horses, are they also works of imitation? Is God a painter who uses his leisure hours to amuse himself in that way? No, the two agree. But does, the, but does this not mean, probes Apollonius, that the art of imitation is twofold? One aspect of it is the use of hands and mind in producing imi imitations. Another aspect, the producing of likenesses with the mind alone. The mind of the beholder, says Gumbridge, also has its share in the imi imitation. And here we are back again with this notion that what we see is not in the world, but it's in our heads. It's either uh, the structure of a, of a meter, uh, it's the structure of a sentence. But now what's going on with painting? Well, Andrea Montaigne, in a painting in the 16th century, uh, Minerva expelling the vices from the garden of virtue, uh, must have known Apollonius. Because when Apollonius is saying that human beings have built-in pattern recognizers, that's what he's saying. Human beings have built-in pattern recognizers in their heads. 
and that the artistry behind representational, i.e. mimetic art, is the ability to put marks and scratches on a canvas in such a way that those pattern recognizers are triggered just as a cloud formation might trigger a built-in face recognition device. Uh, a friend of mine, now unfortunately no longer with us, Sylvan Bromberger, uh, when I was talking to him about this, he said to me, well, yes, he said, you know, artists were the first cognitive scientists. And what he meant by that was that they sort of knew what was built into the brain intuitively, and they figured out techniques on on a two-dimensional object to make that three-dimensional uh, predilection of the brain click in. And that's what my Mises was all about. How do you do it to perfection? This must surely have been in Andrea Mantegna's uh, mind in 1502 when he painted this. There is an Easter egg in this painting. But uh, I'm not going to, uh, I, I mean, if you were in front of the painting, I would say find it. But because it's so small, I'm going to show you. Look at the cloud. There's the face. And in fact, there's a, a partner face just behind it. This is, in fact, Montaigne's joke. Instead of leaving it to the mind of the viewer, Montaigne has forced the image on the viewer. He's put a face in a cloud. I would say this, this should be homage to Apollonius. Now, here is, for me, what really broke it all open. In 2007, a neuroscientist at MIT by the name of Nancy Conwisher gave a talk uh, at a symposium on art in the brain at the University of Illinois, and she observed that, indeed, there must be some relationship between genre types of art, portraits, landscapes, and, uh, uh, and bodies, uh, and... Uh, uh, the, uh, and the natural predilections of the brain because she had done work herself. And what she and her colleagues had discovered was that there are parts of the brain that are dedicated to recognition of these three things. Here is the brain of one of her subjects. And she did brand this on a whole bunch of subjects. And what she showed was that there's an area of the brain called the fusiform gyrus, that if you show, if you tap into it and you show it a face, it fires like mad. If you show it a tree or a car or a shoe, it doesn't do anything, but you show it a face and it moves like mad. There's an area dedicated to places, the same thing, anything that could possibly be seen as a low cow, this part of the brain fires and also bodies. The fusiform gyrus for faces, the parahippocampal area for places, and the extra striate body area for bodies, torsos. And now I'm going to take you through several centuries of Western art, starting with Cimabue. Face, place, body. Duccio, face, place, body. Piero della Francesca, face, place, body. Before we leave this, this is a self-portrait of Piero. And uh, Algis Huxley considered this to be the greatest painting in the world. Raphael, Virgin in the Meadow, face, place, body. Face, place, body, Las Meninas by Velasquez. Hogarth, the orgy from the Rake's Progress, face, place, body. Messonnier, a master of mimetic imagery, campaign of France, face, place, body. And then, boom. 20th century abandoned the shared rules. Recall my argument. In the pre-modern period, art was the product of shared rules. Artists built Easter eggs into their work, my show in music, Chaucer in poetry, Montaigne in painting. But these were hidden bonuses. They were like the arrow in the FedEx logo, there for the seeing, but it really didn't affect the message if you missed it. But as soon as the shared rules were dropped, artists were forced to replace them with their own private formats because you can't have art without rules. Suddenly, Easter eggs mattered a great deal. Appreciating art turned into an Easter egg hunt. And let me show you how that works. The 20th century should be called the age of art as private format. 
Here is a painting which is general, which critics generally agree is the first modernist painting. It's the famous Edition de Célèbre. It was rejected in the Paris, uh, the Paris uh, art exhibits uh, uh, sponsored by the, the state, uh, but it was uh, featured in the uh, the, uh, uh, the counter exhibition of the uh, refused the Déjeuner sur l'Herbe. This is what Eric Kandel says about this painting. This new view led to a re-examination in art of the biological nature of human existence. As evident in Edward Manet's Déjeuner sur l'Herbe of 1863, perhaps the first truly modernist painting from both a thematic and stylistic point of view. Manet's painting, at once beautiful and shocking in its depiction, reveals a theme central to the modernist agenda, the complex relationship between the sexes and between fantasy and reality. Well, maybe. But here is a comment by Ross King in a book called The Judgment of Paris. He says of, Deja, of uh, the Dejeuner sur l'Herbe, it was in many ways a defiant painting. That's interesting, a defiant painting. Manet had copied or adapted numerous old masters, but never had he given his sort such an audacious spin. He was not simply copying Raphael. He was cheekily reworking him, turning a mythological scene from one of the most celebrated engravings of the Renaissance into a tableau of somewhat vulgar Parisian holidaymakers in whom the morally fastidious might detect indecent undertones. Well, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about this. This is the celebrated engraving. The 15th century engraver, Marc Antonio Raimondi, produced a famous engraving called The Judgment of Paris, after a design by Raphael in whose studio Raimondi worked. The engraving embodies many of the tropes of classical art, nude figures, drapery hidden genitalia, mythological figures. The theme is a, is a Greek mythological theme and it evokes Paris being roped into judging who is the most beautiful, Hera, Athena, or Aphrodite, he chooses Aphrodite, and all hell breaks loose and we have the Trojan War. From this, okay, so this is essentially the Ramondi graving. Now take a look at this. Look at the lower right-hand corner. Look at that disposition of figures. Now look at Manet. It's the same. What he's doing is making fun of it. That's what this picture is about. It's poking a finger in the eye of everything that had gone before, of the classical tradition of painting. He's saying, I give you this, Messonnier. From this point on, private formats began to multiply like heads on a, on a hydra. I'll come to this point again, but I think I'd like to make, to make this point now. I'm going to show you a school. This is Fauvism, which fo uh, sh uh, followed, uh, let's see, when did the, the, uh, uh, the day, uh, the day was 1863, yeah. And here, uh, uh, 37, 41 years, uh, 42 years later, you have Henri Matisse's open window, uh, an example of a school of Fauvism where what's really important here is not showing you what is actually looks like outside that window, but showing you the relationships of colors in the real world. I think Fauvism last, didn't last a very long time, but Fauvism was a school. But what's interesting about this is between Manet in 1863, and we're going to say Pollock, which I'll come to, in 1951, no, 1962, there were 500 different schools of painting. When the shared rules were dropped, at that point there was just one school or a couple of schools. But then, once the shared rules were dropped, there was an explosion of schools. And each one said, you do it this way. It's either my way or the highway. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Phyllis Freeman that uh, uh, actually did some work on all of this and discovered these 500 schools. And in, sadly, her work is in the Smithsonian Institute in files. I discovered that on the net and I actually called the Institute Smithsonian and I asked if I could see it. 
and they said no that uh, I couldn't unless I went down there. I'm in a wheelchair, so I, it's, going down there is not easy. But there is a, a PhD thesis for somebody. There's all of that preliminary work sitting in the in the Smithsonian Institute, and I I don't think anybody's looking at it. But in any case, I they sent me some samples of it, and it looks very interesting. Well, here's one school. This is Fovism of the 500. Now, this is the most famous of all. There was Cubism. Uh, and this is Pablo Picasso's Girl with Mandolin. But I want to point out to you something. This is not that radical a painting. Notice face, place, and body. You recognize a face. You recognize a place. You recognize a body. There's not much difference between that and, and the Dejeuner Soudaire. But the style, of course, is quite striking. But it's still recognizable, easily recognizable, as a um, uh, as a figure. Uh, this is Cubism, uh, uh, the art that Picasso and Brock and Leger uh, uh, had uh, created. And uh, in 1992, uh, it was commented on in a very clever cover of the New Yorker. Uh, what you see here is uh, on the right. John Singer Sargent's Madame X, 1884, and on the left, Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror, 1932. And uh, what uh, uh, Russell Connor did was he reversed the direction of Madame X in the actual painting. She's looking in the other way. Uh, but this way, you see, you can have them looking past one another. And that was, of course, the joke. This was, uh, this was a pre-modernism painting uh, looking, what, looking in the uh, in the past, and modernism looking out into the future. But again, you can see that that's a figure that's very conservative. I mean, in, to my way of looking at it, I mean Picasso. There you see a face, a place, and a body. To my way of looking at it, there's no difference between these two pictures than there is between a Corvette and a and a, a, a Toyota Corolla. It's just different the style, but it's the same thing. You want to see that something different, that's different. And this, in fact, is so different that the art historians have given it a name, analytic cubism. That is supposed to be a picture of an accordionist. And there is an accordionist in there, I think. I mean, if you look carefully here, those could be four fingers and those could be the accordion chords, the button chords. Maybe that's a face there, but boy, you work hard here. It's not like that. And this is when uh, Cubism really took off. And Robert Rosenblum, in his book, Cubism in 20th Century Art, uh, said the following very uh, perspicacious comment about what was going on. In place of earlier perspective systems, mimesis, that determined the precise location of discrete objects and illusory depth, Cubism offered an unstable structure of dismembered planes and indeterminate spatial positions. Dismembered is really the operative word here. Instead of assuming that the work of art was an illusion of a reality that lay beyond that, i.e. my mimesis, cubism proposed that the work of art was itself a reality. Okay, we've cut all moorings with uh, trying to depict the world. Now we've let loose. We've hit, we've basically hit the hornet's nest with a, with a baseball bat and we've let fly 500 hornets was itself a reality that represented the very process by which nature is transformed into art. Now it became a private thing. You had to work on that yourself and figure out and get what pleasure you could from yourself. Art then went into even more abstract uh, forms. This is one of those schools of the 500, Tachism. Uh, uh, it comes from the French tache, meaning stain, and this is a uh, Pierre Soulage, who's a French practitioner of uh, abstract expressionism. I mean, this is, of course, Franz Klein, the American uh, answer to Pierre Soulage and his forms. Again, just marks and scratches now on a, on a, on a uh, canvas with their own aesthetic and not attempting at all to tell you this is a chair or a part of a fence or anything like that. No, it's whatever it's whatever it's telling you, it's private. It's up to you to figure that out. Mark Rothko, this is rather interesting. It's a white center. Now, Rothko knew what he wanted you to see here. 
He said this, I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. And the fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures shows that I can communicate these basic human emotions. If you are moved only by their color relationships, then you miss the point. All right, I confess I am one of those who's moved only by their color relationships and therefore I miss the point. To me, this is a very pleasant looking. I mean, if I saw it, uh, it uh, for example, if I saw this uh, pattern on uh, serviettes for a, uh, a table setting, I'd probably buy it. I like it. It's quite pleasant. But I never thought I couldn't see it at all as an object that would cause you to cry until that is. I told this story to a friend of mine who's an editor of a local magazine. And she said, well, you know, when I first saw this painting, I cried. Oh, that told me, wait a minute, Jay, something's going on here. If she cries, and if Rothko thinks other people cry, what's going on? Well, I don't have the answer to that, but I'd like to make a, an interesting suggestion, what I think is an interesting suggestion. Well, forget about whether it's interesting or not. Let me just say, I'll make a suggestion, no editorial comments. Look. It turns out that one in every 200 people are synesthetic. But what that means is that one in 200 people have the ability to associate a color with a number. When they see number one, they also see yellow. Or when they see number five, they see purple. This, is, this particular function is interesting. Not everybody has it, one in 200 do. There's a neuroscientist who's written on aesthetic matters by the name of Ramachandran. And he suggests that this is not accidental, that it's probably related to the fact that in the brain, the area that seems to be associated with number, the shape of numbers is, in, is uh, quite close to the area that deals with colors. And so you can easily imagine an emergent property in one in every 200 people. Namely, you have the axons that are going their way for the numbers and you have the axons going their way for the colors. And each axon is sending out 10,000 dendrites and there are billions of axons. And so there's going to be a countless number of dendritic, uh, possible dendritic uh, uh, networks. And it's possible that one of them associates the color with the, with the, with the number just by accident. Well, one in 200 have that ability. So it may well be that people who see in Rothko and cry are because they are emotionally synesthetic and they see a relationship between emotions and colors. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if anybody's ever studied that, but it sounds reasonable. That's, I mean, that there obviously are emerging properties like synesthesia, and maybe that's what Mark Rothko was actually painting. Maybe he was like that. And maybe that was his Easter egg. Now, the most famous of all, of course, is Jackson Pollock. He was considered to be the, the height of abstract American abstract expressionism. In fact, this painting, number one, is the only one that Gumbrich gives a pullout, a full pullout uh, uh, illustration of in his book, Art and Illusion. Of all of the famous paintings that he talks about, this is the one where you can double fold and look at the whole painting. Now, what's interesting about this painting is everybody seems to like it. I mean, every, for all age groups, children like it, adults like it. I like it myself. I, I find it very pleasant, and I really enjoy it. And I mean, I would love to have this in my, in my home. The physicist Richard P. Taylor and his colleagues published work in 2002 indicating something very interesting about this painting. They argued that Pollock's drip paintings were essentially fractal in nature. Taylor and his colleagues suggested that Pollock had developed an art form that appealed to another predilection of the brain, namely recursion. They referred to a survey that highlighted the possibility that the enduring popularity of Pollock's fractal expressionism is based on an instinctive appreciation for nature's fractals shared by Pollock and his audience. They did experiments with 120 people, 90% of them found fractal energy more appealing. And so this particular painting, its Easter egg is that it's a fractal. 
And that actually touches a predilection of our, uh, built into our brain. So it's not necessarily the case that what shared rules were dropped and artists developed new private formats. It doesn't necessarily mean that one of the private formats that they, that all of their private formats were things that you had to work at intellectually because the brain wasn't doing any sorting out a la Andrea Moro to help you. That you, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Now let's take a look at this. This is essentially a famous iconic painting of the camp that Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup Camps. Now any critic who would talk about these this painting, which is uh, 1962, as uh, in terms of how well he represented these soup cans would miss the point. Because it's not about the soup cans, is it? This is in fact art, uh, I mean, as a, as, a, as a magazine ad. And what he's done here is he's given you my mesis uh, to a fare thee well. And why is he doing this? Because Andy Warhol is saying, next to this, this. It's a, I mean, it's a repetitious painting, but it's a repetitious painting of something very mundane. And he is poking his finger in the eye of all of the 500 manifestos that began with Manet. So here is Arthur Danto's description of the history of painting in his a book, which I recommend, After the End of Art. The master narrative of the history of art in the West, but by the end, not in the West alone, is that there is an era of imitation. We saw that from Chimabue to Messonnier, followed by an era of ideology. We saw that with the fauvism and the uh, 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 cubism, analytic cubism, uh, abstract expressionism. Uh, there's a whole bunch of isms which I didn't know. There's vorticism, concretism, suprematism, surrealism, dadaism. I mean, there are 500 of them. Art criticism in the traditional and mimetic period was based on visual truth. Well, we saw that. The structure of art criticism in the age of ideology, that is to say the age of the 500 manifestos, is the one from which I sought to disengage myself. He was saying that he didn't like being knocked about from one ism to the other, with each one saying, you do it my way or the highway. It characteristically grounded its own philosophical idea of what art is on an exclusionary distinction between the art it accepted, the true, and everything else as not really art. So here is uh, my uh, kind of a quick and dirty uh, diagram of what happened when modernism uh, abandoned the shared rules of mimesis. The end of the art of imitation was with the Dejeuner Sulerbe, 1863. 500 manifestos, fauvism, etc., intervened. Then Campbell's soup cans did the same for the manif era of manifestos that the Dejeuner Sulerbe did for all of the mimetic art that came before it. And what I find interesting about both, although this is theoretically probably just an accident, is that the bookends that bookended modernism all had to do with lunch. Gustav Mahler in tonal music. He took tonal music to the edge, but interestingly enough, he didn't go over it. So here's what Toruskin says about Mahler. Even within Mahler's output, then, we can observe the pressure to maximize, to exceed all limits and precedents. Where a dominant thirteenth has sufficed as a point of maximum tension in the second symphony, the tenth required nineteenth, a nineteenth chord. How much further could this procedure go? In one sense, the answer is easy. Three more notes can be added to the chord before all the available pitches in the tuning system of Western classical music have been used up. Then what? Less technically, but perhaps more intuitively, Leonard Bernstein said, all of Mahler's testing experiments and incursions were made in terms of the past. His breaking up of rhythms, his post ragnarian stretching of tonality to its very snapping point, but not beyond it. His probings into a new thinness of texture, into bare linear motion, into transparent chamber music like orchestral manipulation. All these adumbrated what was to become 20th century common practice. Well, yes, but not tonality. And Mahler didn't go beyond tonality. Why? Because he did not want to give up shared rules. 
And he didn't. He pushed it as far as he could go, but he never stepped outside of tonality. Who, and by the way, this is the analytical reduction of the 19th court, which I got from Tarusky. Who took it over the edge? Schoenberg. And again, this is all my examples here are from Taruskin. Uh, Taruskin talked about the second quartet, the fourth movement, in which he pointed out that there are five arabesques which have no tonal center at all. These arabesques are definitely non-tonal. They are, in fact, composed from a series of seven notes called the Eshbeg set. And what he did was he picked the melody and the first arabesque, and then he transformed it. And the second arabesque, um, I think he pushed it up a fifth. Then this one up another fifth, up another fifth, up another fifth. This became part of the, the drill of writing a tonal music. You picked uh, 12, uh, I think you picked 12 notes, and then uh, you were allowed to uh, manipulate them in various fashions until you used up all 12 before you could use uh, the, any one again. That sort of algorithmic uh, constraint. But the interesting thing is, these 12, the, these seven notes, which make up the arabesque, came from the Eshbeg set. And where, what is the Eshbeg set? Well, um, I, th I think I'm remembering correctly when Truskin said that it was uh, uh, Richard Strauss who, who uh, uh, first suggested this. They actually come from the letters of Schoenberg's name. Those letters pronounced in German are the names of A, D, E flat, C, B, B flat, E, and G. Now that is an Easter egg par excellence. We all have built into our heads tonal music, but we do not have built into our heads Arnold Schoenberg's name. So the use of a composer's name was of course not original with Schoenberg. The Bach motif is famous. He used it, in, for example, he used the four letter, four notes corresponding to the letters of his name uh, in the last contrapunctus of the art of the fugue and many other places. But the difference between Bach, who did so, and, uh, and Schoenberg is enormous. Bach usage was an Easter egg in the Machot sense. It was there, but it made no difference to parsing the music, which being total was shared, tonal was shared with the listener. For Schoenberg, the initials of his name formed a private format out of which a composition was built that was at pains to obscure any notion of a tonal center. Schoenberg, intentionally or otherwise, was challenging his listener to solve a musical puzzle. Here is how Taruskin put it in his comments on Six Little Piano Pieces by Schoenberg, which was produced four or five years after the quartet. No single pitch emerges from the texture with sufficient frequency to suggest itself as a candidate tonic. It would appear that the whole conventional vocabulary of music has been suppressed in favor of private language. Here is how Lerdahl summed it up in an article. In the Western tradition, the trouble began with the exhaustion of tonality at the turn of the century. Anything became possible. Faced with chaos, composers reacted by inventing their own compositional grammars. Within an avant-garde aesthetic, it became possible to believe that one's own new system was the wave of the future. And in Alex Ross's The Rest is Noise, he says the same thing uh, somewhat differently. The language of modern music was reinvented on an almost yearly basis. 12-tone composition gave way to total serialism which gave way to chance music, which gave way to a music of free-floating campers, which gave way to neo-data happenings and collages and so on. This is a video, I'm going to show you a little bit of this clip, from a program called uh, What's My Line? The man on the left was the uh, moderator, Gary Moore, and the man on the right is John Cage. And what Gary Moore was doing, what, well, I'll let you see. Now, Mr. Cage, I know that you teach a course in experimental sound at the new school. Experimental music. Experimental music. Yes. Uh, will you tell us quite seriously whether or not you consider what we're about to hear music? 
No tongue in well, cheek, but serious. No, perfectly seriously. I consider music the uh, production of sound. And since in the piece which you will hear I produce sound, I would call it music. <laughs> goes on, but I thought that was enough. Now, the thing about that is this. Cage says that sound is any uh, is music, but that's really, that can't be what he means, or maybe it is, I don't know. But that means that what you've been listening to for the last hour and a half has been music. But that's because he has essentially abandoned all of the rules of classical music. But it's his job to substitute those with rules. And it isn't clear at all what rules are going on there. So there is a private format which is so deeply hidden that I think it's lost. And of course, if music is sound, why is it that Cage's most popular, famous piece of music is silence of four minutes and 33 seconds? So I think what's happening here is that this is the extreme to which uh, art went uh, uh, when the rules were abandoned. Now, many people, uh, I, I think you can understand Cage and in fact appreciate Cage uh, if you look at him as a performance artist and not as a composer. Uh, and it's no accident, I think, that uh, people don't remember any music that he's composed, although they do remember uh, lots of things that he said. That he said. All right. Now remember that as I, so I've done art and I've done music and now I want to do poetry and then I'll stop. Ezra Pound said, break the, uh, uh, broke, said Ezra Pound breaks the pentameter. In an essay about Ezra Pound, uh, Ernest Hemingway said, any poet born in the century, in this century, or in the last 10 years of the preceding century, who can honestly say that he has not been influenced by or learned greatly from the work of Ezra Pound, deserves to be pitied rather than rebuked. It is as if a prose writer born in that time should not have learned from or been influenced by James Joyce, or that a traveler should pass through a great blizzard and not have felt its cold or a sandstorm and not have felt sand and the wind. I read that because it it's just simply saying that Pound says break the back of the, of, the, uh, of the pentameter, you might say, well, so what? Who's Pound? Well, Pound was highly regarded. Donald Hall in his book, Remembering Poets, uh, says that he's the single most influential poet uh, of, uh, of his time. And of course, we know his relationship to, uh, uh, to T.S. Eliot. In any case, poetry ceased to rhyme and it ceased to be metrical. Here is a poem that is produced by one of the great poets of the 20th century. And this particular poem does not rhyme and it does not uh, have meter. Theory, I am what's around me. Women understand this. One is not duchess a hundred yards from the carriage. These then are portraits, a black vestibule, a high bed sheltered by curtains. These are merely instances. My feeling is that if you don't know this poem, and you read this, you really don't have much of a feeling for what it's about. You may have a sense, but I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense uh, to a, a first reader. I mean, it be like most uh, poems written in this style, it, ra it raises more questions than it answers. I am what is around me, okay. Women understand this, why women? Why not men? One is not a duchess a hundred yards in the carriage, okay, fine. But 
why is it, why are we then looking at portraits of black vestibule or high bed sheltered by curtains? The whole thing seems to be sort of shots in the dark. It's a little bit like the uh, five arabesques of, uh, of the Eshbeck set. In fact, it's very much like it. If you know the key, namely the, uh, the Eshbeck set and the transpositions, you know what those five arabesques are. Well, there's a key to this too. And I'll show you what's going on. Look at the first line, I am what is around me. It contains, and now look at the second line. The first word of the second line contains me, M-E. But what's around me? W-O-N. But how do you spell, how do you pronounce W-O-N? One. But what's the first word of the next line? One. And what's the first word of the next line? It's one reduced. And now these are portraits. Well, what are these portraits of? These are portraits of places that, in, that contain people. Now look at women. Women is an orthographic form that contains a person. Women, the word contains me. A black vestibule is an area that contains a person. Now it's clear why these are, uh, why, these are why, it's, why you would put these in here. Uh, these are uh, visual counterparts of women. And women understand this. Why women? Because women contains me. In other words, the whole poem is around me. And that's the discourse. And once you understand this, you can say to yourself, say, that's a pretty good poem. But if you don't understand it, then you'll go off on flights of fancy about what this is about. But that's, but there is, but the poet is not helping you. And there is nothing predetermined in your brain that will bring this out. It's up to you to find it. And if you don't find it, well, that's just too bad. Well, take a look at this poem by John Ashbery, who won all kinds of prizes as being one of the great poets of the 20th century. And look here, I'll read the poem to you. To employ her construction ball, morning fed on the light blue wood of the mouth, cannot understand, feels deeply. A wave of nausea, numerals, a few berries, the unseen claw, bay bask the day the background of poles roped over and a star jolted them. Filthy or into backward drenched flung heaviness, lemons asleep pattern crying. I personally have no idea what it's about. I, I just don't get it, and I doubt seriously I ever will. Ashbery, the poet, would not be surprised. Asked by an interviewer for NPR in 2005 whether his poems were accessible, he responded, well, I'm told that they're not. He continued, what they are is about the privacy of all of us and the difficulty of our own thinking. In other words, that poem that I just read can be seen as an Ashbury hallucination. But we have no access to his hallucinations. So it maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but that's where modern poetry that abandoned rules uh, brought us. Now, what does it mean? What does all of this mean? 250 years before modernism, there was another upheaval in the way things were perceived. I'm thinking of the Newtonian revolution in science. Prior to Newton, Galileo and Descartes saw the world as one gigantic mechanical device. The job of the scientist was to discover the pieces and determine how they fit together. This way of looking at the world was meant, was what was meant by seeing the world as intelligible. Newton's theory of gravity, which entailed action at a distance, put an end to that. After all, there could be no mechanism whose parts did not come in contact, contact with one another. This led to a way of doing science, which was about theories of the way things were, not about the way things actually were, because we had no access to the latter. Akhil Bilgami, in his introduction to Chomsky's What Kind of Creatures Are We, put it this way. Newton overturned the contact mechanical assumptions of the early modern science that preceded him, which were scientific consolidations of our common sense understanding, presumably determined by the cognitive limits of our biology, of the world of objects. And Noam, in a series of lectures in 2019, said it this way, 
Newton showed that there are no machines, that the material world simply cannot be captured in mechanical terms because of interaction without contact, which is inconsistent with the mechanical philosophy. So the end result is we have theories like Newton's that we can understand, but no intelligible world. What they describe is simply unintelligible. This is what I conclude. I argue that Newtonianism and modernism are two sides of the same coin. The shift in how science was done and the sea change in the sister arts of poetry, painting, and music were both responses to our relinquishing the whole that a common sense understanding of the world of objects had on the way we practiced science and art. In both cases, the brain ceased to depend primarily on its natural proclivities and was forced to create new ones that were not natural at all. The products of science and of art became inaccessible. And that's all, folks. Thank you, Jay. This is uh, an amazing, an amazing tour de force, and uh, and an incredible uh, excursion through through the arts that takes us to uh, very philosophical philosophical points about uh, aesthetics and, and appreciation, I guess generally our our existence we have some wonderful uh uh personalities as participants and i imagine that we'll we'll have some questions i hope you will allow for some questions and please type them either in the q a or in the text chat box or i can connect you via audio or video if you want to argue it out with um with with jay um and I guess I'll ask you a couple myself as people are gathering, gathering their thoughts. Um, when you and I spoke, you very quickly uh, centered on uh, one striking sentence. You said, well, we, when you hear a middle C and we say, well, that's a middle C, um, we, we have no idea what that means and what, what, how, how that is actually perceived or functioning in our in our brain and there we get into uh, into beautifully mysterious area and I would love to hear you speak more a little bit more about that well um, I, uh, I here's what I meant by that um, we do not have the slightest idea how knowledge is represented in the brain. I mean, we're looking at, we look at, for example, uh, we can put probes into an area and we can uh, show the subject a face and the area will light up. But the subject has in the subject's mind that image of the face. But we have no idea how you go from the circuitry of the brain to that impression. And that's what I'm saying is uh, a mystery. And now what I was suggesting to you when I said about middle C is that may well be a mystery that we are unable to solve because we may not have them. We may not be smart enough creatures. Look, we can talk about frogs and say, well, you know, they're nice animals and they're beautifully engineered. They've, they survived in the world one million years without any genetic modification at all, which means that the instructions that created this frog were very, very efficient. But that frog will never understand quantum mechanics. And, that, and it's very possible that when I say cup and you conjure up in your head a mem um, an image of cup, it's very possible that whatever it is you're doing is beyond our ability to understand because we don't have the wet wear. So that it's, that it's rather uh, a mystery than a solvable problem, as I think Mr. Chomsky puts it in, in one of his lectures. Look, look, you know, there are many mysteries and those mysteries may be because we haven't worked hard enough or it may mean that we can't no matter how hard we work. 
And that's always going to be a possibility out there. Um, I don't know if it's going to uh, affect us anyway. We're going to pretend that we can know everything. But the hard truth is that that may be false. There's a, um, there's a comment from, uh, from Paul Bogosian, a philosopher at NYU. Uh, fascinating. He says, the theory would predict that art forms that break the shared rules would be inaccessible, but modern and contemporary art is highly popular. On the other hand, the late Beethoven quartets, which presumably do not break the shared rules, are often found inaccessible by many. So what's your, what's your response there? Well, uh, there, uh, I think that there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. That is to say, the rules that are, uh, there's no doubt that the rules are, uh, are uh, at least what I'm claiming is that the rules are internalized. But you may, uh, 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 that doesn't mean that you are determined by those rules to like the product. And so your reactions to it can be the result of any number of things, namely what you like, what you've heard before, your experience. It may well be that you find the, shakes, the Beethoven inaccessible, but I'll wager that if you listen to it 10 or 20 times or study it, it won't be inaccessible anymore. And so the same thing is true with respect to uh, uh, modernist rules. There are uh, uh, there are uh, art forms which you can find, uh, uh, which you might well find uh, uh, highly pleasing, and they're based on things which are not uh, uh, hardwired in the brain, but rather are sort of nat uh, unnatural constructs of the intellectual function. So I don't think that there has to be a one-to-one -one correlation between whether something is tonal or not. Uh, I mean, whether something is internalized or not and what you like. Uh, that is a very long chain of events, which, uh, uh, which I really don't understand. Uh, there are hints to it for, uh, uh, about how the, the brain works with respect to aesthetics. And that's what I think we need to be able to understand before we can answer with more clarity than I provided uh, the, uh, uh, the question that just asked. So for example, um, there's this woman, Elizabeth Margulis, uh, who was a student, I think, of Lairball, and I think a friend of yours, uh, uh, Carol. Uh, she did a, a remarkable experiment in which she took a, uh, 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 pieces by uh, uh, Berio, Luciano Berio and Elliot Carter, and she built in repetition where there was no repetition. And she asked people which they liked better. She would play the original and the uh, doctored pieces. And it turned out that untutored people liked the repetition better. And when she did that for tutored people, people who study, uh, PhD holders who study musical theory and a tonal uh, uh, artist, uh, it turns out that they liked uh, the repetition better. And what Margulis says is this is really quite remarkable. Here we have the work of two master composers and I can change how we react to them simply by using cut and paste and make it more pleasurable. So what that suggests is that there's a tremendous amount that we don't know about this process of what we've, but what that does suggest is that repetition is pleasurable, whether we like it or not, it's, it gives us pleasure. And that's hardwired, that's built in. That's the kind of study that we're gonna to have to perform in order to, understand, to give a, a more cogent answer uh, to the question. There is that, that famous quote from Schoenberg who uh, says, I think somewhere, that it would appear that a certain amount of repetition is necessary to, to, make, to make music comprehensible. So he, he obviously had, had sensed yeah. that as well. He was aware of that. But, you know, it's sort of interesting. Uh, uh, I have a friend of mine. I may have mentioned this to you, uh, Kiro. Uh, but I have a friend of mine who is um, a, um, a Phil uh, Wilson will know him. I think they played together, um, uh, 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 certainly at Berkeley. Uh, but he's written a book on arrangements and in a 
conversation that I had with him, uh, he said that there's a, um, a well-known rule of three. Uh, and the rule of three says you can repeat something once, but if you repeat it a second time, you run the risk of boredom. And so uh, I mentioned this to Fred Lairdahl, and he said, oh, yes, composers, classic composers know about the rule of three as well. So there is something about repetition which is, um, uh, is pleasurable. Margolis, has, I think, has shown that. On the other hand, uh, uh, um, May West once said, too much of a good thing is wonderful. Uh, but apparently that doesn't apply to repetition. So you have to be careful. And it is no accident that if you look at the form of jazz standards, it's repeat, repeat, bridge, repeat. You don't do, you do not do repeat, 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 bridge. You do bridge, you do, you know, you do uh, eight bars, eight bars, bridge, same eight bars. And there's a whole, uh, Mozart based the same thing. I mentioned that to you, I think. Uh, if you look at his uh, dance, uh, num uh, the German dance number one, he obeys the rule of three. Um, so there's some, so we need to study what it is about our hardware that produces pleasure. And that's got to be the basis of a science of, uh, of aesthetics. There is a uh, question and comment from uh, David Pöppel. Um, he says, hi, Jay, your book is cool, fun and provocative. I was struck by the, quote, amount of work required by the beholder. Let's assume that the human mind brain stayed the same between 1899 and 1901 for the sake of argument. We have an operating system, our brain, that has certain properties that provide hard constraints or bounds on what we can do in the privacy of our own heads, perception, cognition, affect, etc. One big shift that you are illustrating, advertently or inadvertently, is that the beholder's share, in the words of Gombrich, has changed dramatically from earlier to modern stages. Maybe the alignment between the rules that were shared was very close and then became misaligned. Well, I think that's, I, I agree with that. I mean, that's a very cogent comment. Uh, that's true. That's yes. Right. Um, so let's see if, we, if uh, I can, um, I guess what, uh, uh, just to expand just a tiny bit on what uh, David just said, I'm really suggesting that perception of art actually shifted location in the brain that it moved to from the left frontal lobe, for example. I mean, it moved from Broca's area to that area of the brain that deals with general intelligence. And general intelligence treated art as a puzzle that had to be solved rather than a, uh, 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 rather than a reaction to, a, to a, a pleasant reaction. In other words, it moved from being a wind chime the wind blows through it, and you know you, it chimes. It moved from that to some to a an intellectual activity that you had to build yourself. And and your claim is that uh, the shift, literally within the areas of the brain, was also due to the fact that there was no further place to expand in terms of pushing the pushing the tonality, pushing pushing the saturation of of late romanticism, essentially. Yes, yes. Fascinating. And by the way, Phil Wilson uh, uh, has commented that he's been writing Easter eggs for a lifetime. And uh, well, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think uh, we know that. And David Purple says, nope, I disagree, says, says he. So. If 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 you want if you want we can we can connect uh, David in in voice or um, uh, or video but he says maybe additional brain areas are recruited but no shift smiley. Yeah, you know, I mean, the question is, uh, to what extent is the brain changing? Now, I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, um, I'm not sure that I that. Uh, 
the conditions for evolution for the human mind exist any longer. Uh, I'm not really an expert in this area, but I've been told that evolution was actually uh, supported uh, when there were small populations isolated from one another, that you would get m many more possibilities of, uh, of change. Um, but um, um, uh, I don't know if evolution is possible. That's why there's so much attention to computers. That's how human beings think they're going to evolve, by uh, adding to our computational ability uh, with uh, cheap computer memory. But you're skeptical about that. I am. I am, because I really think, you see, I, I, let me try to say this uh, in a way which doesn't sound um, um, super sentimental. When nature created the human mind, it created something which I wouldn't be surprised is unique in the universe. It created an organ that could actually produce an infinite number of thoughts. Language is a pale kind of a device to capture what it is that we can think. We can probably think far more than we can express. And to me, the really great addition to uh, uh, would be to find some way to tap into mental representations other than language. But that I think is, uh, you know, science fiction. But what I'm saying is that what's really incredible about the brain is its ability to essentially produce an infinite number of thoughts. And uh, that's what we're studying now uh, when we look at this. Uh, when we look at aesthetics, it's just one aspect of what we're thinking. Um, I just think, you know, every time somebody uh, is killed, it's like you're burning a paint, you're burning a work of art. It's a tremendous loss. But because there are so many of us, we think it's cheap. That's a beautifully humanistic uh, note to, uh, to, to sound. Um, on a somewhat lighter note, speaking about repetition, I hope that in the, in the fall uh, semester, you agree to rejoin us. And uh, in that sense, it would be repetition. And for you to talk about repetition, because you told me that, you, that some of your recent work and thought is concentrated on repetition in poetry and music. You gave a little bit of a preview of that today, but I hope that you'll agree to, um, to come on again and, and, and speak to us about that. And uh, without uh, exposing you too much. I was just going to say the work that I've been doing on repetition is with Ray Jackendorf. We, we, we talk about twice, once a week. And over the course of the past year or so, we've been looking at repetition in a lot of different art forms. And uh, I've managed to put it together into one statement. And uh, uh, I'd be very glad to share it with people. So I hope, I hope you'll come uh, by yourself. And uh, Ray is, of course, most invited to uh, to join. And uh, on a more private note, uh, but with our participants here, I want to wish you a happy birthday. I know that it's your birthday today, and uh, it's uh, it's an honor that you chose to spend some of some of your birthday with uh, with us today. And. Uh, well, I have to tell you, when you offered me the opportunity to talk about my work, that was the best birthday present. I mean, this has been a terrific birthday for me. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And, uh, and uh, as we mentioned in the very beginning, that's a gorgeous tie. So. Yes. Yes. Ties are a man's jewelry. <laughs> well, Jay, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody that's taken part today and this uh, entire run of the of the series, the, so to say, the second season. And I want to wish you a happy and healthy summer. And uh, I look forward to uh, rejoining uh, here in in the fall. But thank you.
Jay, and happy birthday. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.